you, you braved the weather. That's wonderful. We sure appreciate you being here. Let's say good morning to our Lord. Oh, Lord Jesus, we do thank you for the weather. We do thank you for the people who are on the way. I pray that you give them safety in their travels, travel mercies, per se. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for loving us the way that you do. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you move us aside. Let the Holy Spirit speak to us and just let us love on you. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen.
Lord, we thank you this morning that your mercies are new every morning, that with God there's a second chance and a third chance, and that he's faithful, and that he loves you, and that he has exactly what you need. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that you would meet each and every person that came through the door, that you would lift their heads and lift their burdens from their shoulders. I pray, God, that they would come into the fellowship of your presence this morning and that they would know your peace and that they would know your love and that they would know how much you deeply care for them this morning. Sometimes we can get this thought in our head, and I don't know if this is something that somebody struggles with, but, you know, I know God loves me, but does he really like me? You know, I'm, I'm a sinner, and I, I, I just sometimes make mistakes, and I don't get it right. Well, I can assure you this morning that God does not only love you, he likes you. And he's very excited about your life and the plans that he has for your life. And so this morning, we can give him praise from a confident heart, knowing that he has what's best planned for each and every one of us. Amen. Let's worship this morning.
thank you, Lord. It is such a privilege to just be here right now singing to you, putting ourselves aside and just and just singing to you. You are so worthy and we need you so very, very much. Thank you, Jesus.
sweet and tender in the midst of worship. Thank you for making your presence known and meeting with your people here on this cold, rainy morning. God, I pray for those that are at home that you would meet with them right where they're at. Each and every person would just have that special touch from the Lord. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Welcome, church. Good morning. Um, you can have a seat. We are moving into the time of our service where we take our tithes and our offerings. For those of you that are new, as you walk in on the right-hand side, you can give your tithes and offerings in our box, or you can download the Tithely app, or you can go to lmcchurch.com. I want to share scripture with you this morning, but right before we pray. Second Chronicles 31.5, and this is the word of the Lord. As soon as the order went out, the Israelites generously gave the first fruits of their grain, their new wine, and their olive oil, the honey and all that the field produced. They brought a great amount, a tithe of everything. A tithe is a tenth. They came and brought a tenth to the Lord. In just a moment after we pray, I'll give you a moment to get up and do that. But you see, that tenth is our seed. And oftentimes we want to eat our seed, but God says sow it. And when we sow the seed, we talked about it last week, what happens when we sow that tenth? When we sow our seed to the Lord, then it multiplies, right? God's able to do quite a bit with it. So let's pray this morning that God would bless the tithes and the offerings and that he would multiply them for his glory. Heavenly Father, I thank you for each and every person you brought here this morning. God, I pray that you would bless everybody that gives this morning, that you would multiply it. Lord, we thank you for it. We thank you for the rain on the roof, Lord, that fresh sound. God, you are good. Bless the tithes, bless the offering, bless everybody that came into the house of the Lord this morning. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, we'll get up and say good morning to somebody, welcome them, and we'll get into our announcements in just a moment.
Isn't this a wonderful winter, blustery day? <laughs> if you ask my husband, he'll say no. He, he hates the cold and he hates the weather. <laughs> I'm from northern Michigan, and we went, we went to uh, see my family one time, and it didn't stop snowing. And he, and he goes, does it ever stop? <laughs> but, no, love you, I love you, honey, even though you don't like the cold. <laughs> but good morning, everyone. It starts raining hardy right when I said that. <laughs> okay, ah, oh, we have a lot going on these last two weeks. We got our Spring Fest coming up. So we're going to go over a few of our events are canceled this week. And next week. So Monday evening, um, oh, this Friday, I almost skipped my women's group here. This Friday, we're not having women's group. We are going to set up for the Spring Fest. So as I said last week, all hands on deck, please. Anyone that can volunteer, come out um, this Friday. Hopefully we don't have weather like this. <laughs> we will be setting up. We need um, anyone with a strong back, anyone that's quick to take directions. And if you don't, we'll, we'll put you to work anyways. Well, believe me, we'll find something for you to do. So at 10 o'clock, come out on Friday, please. And we hopefully will get everything set up. And as... Like I said, there was no women's group on that morning. Um, on Monday evening Bible study, we're also off. We're going we're gonna to be busy taking care of everything. On the Impact Kids and Chosen Generation, we're off, also off for this week. And for <clears throat> today, <clears throat> we need everyone to, who wants to stay, you don't have to, but we'd love for you to, to come and stuff eggs and prepare for our food bags for the festival. Normally, we give out our food bags at the vendor's market, at Campo Market, but we're going to give our food bags out during this festival. There's a lot of people who are food insecure, um, even those that work full time. I mean, you got two people. I, I went to the grocery store, and I went, wow, that doubled from just a, a few months ago. Well, I guess I can do without that. You know, um, so come out and help. Also, we already talked about March 29th and March 30th, our spring festival. This is a huge event. We have hundreds of people that come through here, uh, children and all kinds of young adults. Let's put on our Lake Marina Community Church face and just love on them, please. And that starts at 12 to 3. And uh, March 31st, we're just having a regular service at uh, 10 a.m. Invite a friend, please. And that, oh, yes, Vanessa just reminded me. We have a cakewalk, and it is popular. So even if you don't want to make a cake, bring something else, cookies, muffins, any, something that is your specialty. I know Edgar loves lemon bars, so I'll probably have to bring something for him. <laughs> but, all right, and I think that is it. Okay. All right, thank you, Ellen. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody here. Um, we are excited for the events that are coming up. Um, I want to say first and foremost, because you're probably thinking, Pastor, have you seen the weather next week? Yes, I've seen the weather next week. But you know what I'm going to say? Rain or shine, we're on. Because you know what? Sometimes you have to get creative. Remember in COVID, we had to do church a different way. Now, this is not COVID. This is just rain, people. But we'll figure it out, okay? We have lots of space here. There's canopies, there's tarps, there's, there's ways around it, okay? So rain, rain or shine, we will be having the Spring Festival next week. Um, and we absolutely need your help. I'm going to reiterate that that volunteer sheet is not full. Um, we still have quite a few spots, right, that are open? Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you for those that came to the meeting, and thank you to those that came today while it was raining, because you know we have work to do after church, and 
with stuffing eggs. And gosh, I'm just so grateful for each and every one of you. Uh, but just to know and to update you where we're at, we still have some spots that need to be filled. So either new people need to set up, step up or we need um, someone to do like a double like a double time. They do the first hour and the second hour. So if you can do that, please see Vanessa afterwards. And please stay afterwards for our spring festival meeting. Um, we will be stuffing eggs and we're going to feed you lunch. Um, and it, we're going to find out all the details of what's coming up in the next week. And like Ellen said, next Friday is our work day. It's 10 a.m., right? Friday at 10 a.m. So it's going to be a lot of setting up. There's going to be a lot of work to do. Uh, we will feed you lunch. So don't worry. You don't have to be working and be hangry and ask Jesus to help you control yourself. Okay, we'll feed you. It'll all be okay. All right. So we are, I'm feeling ornery this morning. Can you tell? All right. Oopsie. See, that's what I get. All right, I am excited to get into what we have today and next week and just to reach our community for Jesus, All right? We've been talking about how it's outside of the four walls. It's not just here. So just remember next week when people come in, you interact with new people, they might casually ask you, oh, well, what time is your service? And don't just say, oh, 10 a.m. How about you say, well, you can come and you can sit with me, right? Make them feel welcome. Make them feel at home, that they won't come in and be a stranger, right? So pray for those God moments, those divine moments, those God opportunities during the spring festival to invite people back to church the next day. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, come on. Right, we're going to go into all the world and preach the good news of the gospel. Well, next week it's right here on our property, but they're coming to us, and we want to them to know that they can have a home here. They can find hope and healing in the name of Jesus, right? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for the opportunity to be here in this place. God, we don't have to serve you. We get to serve you. Lord, what an amazing thing you have given us in your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here today, to learn more about you, and to dive into your word. We thank you for it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, happy Palm Sunday. I am so excited that you're here with us this morning. And I want to talk a little bit about God's love story. God's love story to us. You know, in every love story, there's a point where it starts to get serious, right? Where you ask the other person to marry you. Or you get married, right? But it doesn't start. It says there's a full story from beginning to end. And I think about the Bible, you know, all the way from Genesis to Revelation. Even back in the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, God had already made provision for us to make our way back to Christ, to make our way back to God, right, through Jesus. And what a wonderful God we serve. He knew we were going to mess up. And before we even messed up, right, he's already planning the provision for it because God loves you and he has a great plan for your life. And I love... I love Easter season. I love Resurrection Sunday. Listen, God is in the business of transforming lives and coming into our lives. And as we submit and trust in him, changing lives, bringing hope, bringing healing. How many of us have experienced the healing of Jesus Christ at some point in our life, right? You know that song, The King is Here. That keeps coming into my mind as I'm preaching this. Right? The King is Here. Right? Palm Sunday is all about the big entrance of the King right? He's here. It's time. He's getting ready to go to the cross. There's something big that is happening. And so Jesus, as we've studied in many other chapters, right, he had been ministering. He had been preaching. He had been teaching, right? And even in the book of John, we had learned that, you know, he was healing people. But at that point, he wasn't drawing attention to himself just yet. He says, my time has not yet come. My time has not yet come, right? There wasn't a time for him to be crucified just yet. But here on Palm Sunday is the beginning of when that starts to happen. And so Easter is that time when that happened. You see, Palm Sunday is the beginning of it all. And this week, we celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It's mentioned in all four of the Gospels, right? And Jesus, he entered the city knowing that he would be tried and crucified, right? And that he would die and then resurrect on the cross. Okay? He knew that. He knew that. How many of us, when God puts something in our life and there's suffering ahead, we sign up and we say, yeah, I'm all for it. Yep, let's go. 
We don't do that, right? By nature, we're selfish. By nature, we want what's comfortable. By nature, we want what feels good. But Jesus, the King of Kings, came in well knowing what that week, once it began, where it was headed. There was a direction that it was going. But you see, I don't know that he had his mind solely focused on the suffering. I think he had his mind solely focused on you and I. Don't you think? He sent his one and only son, right? That all who believe in him, right? We accept his forgiveness. We can be forgiven. And so he entered. He entered into Jerusalem as a king. And we'll talk about what that looks like here in just a minute. Well, what was going on at that time, right? The Passover was taking place. It's like the Jewish festival, the celebration of the Israelites, um, the exodus, right, when, when they were freed from Egypt. So there's a lot of people around at this time, a lot of people that would see Jesus come riding in on a donkey, okay? That particular time they celebrated, right, and they would mark their door frames with the lamb's blood, right, so that the angel of death would pass over each Jewish household. Remember in the Old Testament, right? Pharaoh's oldest uh, son, oldest or youngest, well, Pharaoh's son died, right? And the death passed over, but it didn't get God's people because they put the blood of the lamb over the door. Well, you see, Jesus coming in to Jerusalem right at the time of Passover. It's not a coincidence. It's because Jesus is now the Passover lamb, right? No longer do they need to do sacrifice. He is the spotless, perfect Passover lamb. So all of the Jews are gathered tightly there. Um, they're getting ready to offer sacrifices at the temple. But now we don't have to do that anymore because Jesus is the Passover lamb. However, there was a stirring and there was an excitement in the air. Something was going to happen. There was this king and this Messiah that would enter into Jerusalem. And he was coming in to be the rightful king. I can imagine the stirring among the people. And we've talked about it before, some of the history is that the people were oppressed by the Romans, and they wanted to be free. They wanted to be free in so many ways, and they thought that Jesus would come and make their life better. And he did, but he had a different plan, and he was going to do it a different way. Okay? And so we're going to look at this story here. I'll have you open your Bibles, but not, not quite yet. I want to read this little excerpt. It's just a good one. As he came to Bethpage, he mounted his donkey. He would have been surrounded by people going up to Jerusalem. Right? So the festival's going on, and they're all heading there. He says, when he reached the top of the Mount of Olives, he looked over the city of Jerusalem. He would have seen crowds of people stirring at the city gates. And the word spread that the king is coming. The pilgrims who were already in the city came out to greet him. Therefore, as Jesus rode down into the Kidron Valley, there were people in front of him, behind him, and all around him. They were waving palm branches and throwing down their robes to make a procession of praise. They kept shouting and shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. As Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem, a large crowd gathered and laid palm branches and cloaks across the road, giving Jesus royal treatment. You see, palm branches were used in celebration of victory. Okay, And the people's cloaks and garments were spread out on the road for this triumphal entry. This was more than an act of honor. It was a big deal. It signified that Jesus is king. A sign and a symbol of our lives is being surrendered to him. And Jesus isn't any king. He's a king that comes in peace and a king that we can entrust our lives to. And Jesus came in peace knowing that he would suffer. He entered anyways. In Matthew 20, 19, this is what it says. When they drew near to Jerusalem... Jesus knew, he knew that the religious leaders were going to arrest him, that they were going to condemn him, that they were going to mock him and scourge him and deliver him to the Romans for crucifixion. I'm going to give you a challenge this week. And I'm sure you've all seen it, but I want you to watch the Passion of the Christ because that's Easter. And listen, we celebrate. I love doing egg hunts. I love doing all those things, but that's not Easter, okay? Jesus on the cross, that is Resurrection Sunday. This week, take time to put everything down. Watch that movie. Be reminded of the horrific suffering that Jesus went through for you and for me. Keep your mind in the right place and be grateful for all that he has done. He, he went in knowing that this is what was going to happen. 
Not only did he have the courage to enter Jerusalem, but to enter in a public way. Remember, we talked about that, that he said, it's not my time, but now it's his time, okay? It's time to get serious. Let's go to Matthew 21. We're going to read this story. Matthew 21. I'll give you a minute to turn there. And I would say with that movie, use your good judgment with little kids because it is pretty gory, but it's really a good one. And it gives you a a real revelation of what Jesus went through. All right, Matthew 21. Here we go. As they approached Jerusalem and they came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with a colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. So, you see here, it's the colt and the mother. If anyone has anything to say to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Verse 4. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Verse 5. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from trees and spread them out on the road. I want you to picture this as we're reading. The crowd, that there's so many people that they're bumping into each other that there's little kids that can't see what's going on and they're trying to reach over the shoulder of the person in front of them. There's palm branches and there's an excited feeling in the air. Have you ever been in a crowd when things are stirring and something's about to happen and everybody's excited? The crowds, in verse 9, the crowds went ahead of him and those who followed shouted. So here's Jesus coming, right? He's coming and he's got crowds in front of him and behind him and they're shouting, Hosanna! to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. You see, Jesus' entrance made a big statement in a big way. The time is now. He is saying he is the king. He is the Messiah. Right? And this is the very thing that's going to get him crucified a little bit later. He is the rightful king. And the people would know from Old Testament prophecy in Zechariah. We read that. In Zechariah 9.9, 9, this is what it's referring to. There's a spot in the Old Testament that prophesied the coming of Jesus on a colt. So we see it prophesied in the Old Testament, and we see it come to life in the New Testament. He says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Jerusalem. And this is what's prophesied in the Old Testament. See, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation. He comes. What does he bring? Salvation for people, for all of mankind. And he's gentle, and he's riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. You see, Jesus mounted the donkey, but not any donkey, a purebred colt. He was presenting himself as Israel's promised king. By his actions, he was saying, your king is here. Your king is here. How often do we miss the fact, church, that our king is here? In church, you know, we can have that same stirring. We can have that same excitement in the crowd. We can have that same praise. We can have that same adoration that happened on Palm Sunday as Jesus came in on the colt riding on a donkey. Because today our king is here. But today, we serve a living, resurrected king, right? And we serve him from a position of victory. This morning, church, I want to remind you, sometimes we feel like we have to fight for God to love us. We have to fight to get it right. We have to fight to serve well. We have to wrestle. We have to fight. No, church, you don't. You don't. You know why? Because Jesus already had the victory. We serve from a place of victory. We love from a place of victory. We give from a place of victory. Because victory has already taken place. He's already conquered sin and death. He's already been resurrected. We are not defeated, but we are victorious, church. You see? But we walk around defeated. 
We got to remember that our king is with us. And this is just the beginning. He's heading towards that cross. And as we get to Easter, we'll talk about the resurrection and the power that comes in the resurrection. But I want you to be reminded as we go through the stories this week, and I'll do my best. Last year, I did something on Friday for Good Friday. Um, we didn't have anything here, but we had a, like a devotion on our Facebook page. And so to lead you from that moment where the king is here and he comes in, to the grueling moments up to the cross, to the resurrection, to the celebration of the resurrection, and to walk with you this week while we go through it. Your king is here. I want you to remember that this morning. Your king is here, and if you've accepted him, he, he lives in your heart. He lives in your heart. And we can live victoriously with him. You see, the people were claiming Jesus to be their rightful king. Is Jesus your rightful king today? Is Jesus the king of your heart? Are you surrendered to him? Have you laid everything down, all your garments? Hmm. Sometimes we want to carry them around, don't we? Have you laid down your garments before the Lord? Have you surrendered and given everything to him? I find that these people were fickle. They were so excited that the king had come. And we're so excited, right? We get so excited when Jesus comes into our life and we feel his presence and we're like, wow, I've never felt that kind of love before. That was amazing. I felt peace beyond understanding. And then Jesus says, lay your garments down. And we say, what? Mm, a sacrificial, surrendered life. But it's not a powerless life. It's a powerful life when the rightful king is the king of your life. Come on. We serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And if you're willing to lay it down and follow after him, you will live a life empowered for the king. Don't be like the fickle people in the crowd that said, Hosanna, Hosanna. And they said, save us. That's, that's what Hosanna means, save us. But then later they were the same people that said, crucify him. Oh, we're so fickle. And you think, oh, I would never tell you. I would never say that. But we do it in other ways, church. God calls us to do things, and we get, <clears throat> I'm not going to do that. We crucify God in other ways with our actions. But we can live a life of sacrificial love, just like Jesus did. We're buried with him when we let him live through us. Right? He becomes powerful when we hide, when we step aside and let him work through us. You see, Jesus came for us not when we had it all together, right? But when we were sinners, and he, he chose, he came in that Sunday, knowing that all the praise would soon be gone. The excitement of the crowd would soon turn into rage. He would soon be carrying a cross on his back that was so heavy that he could hardly walk. The blood would be dripping down his face from the crown of thorns on his head. And that that same crowd of excitement behind him would be yelling, now crucify him. How quickly it would shift. But he did it. This is the celebration of all of this. This is the greatest part that he still said yes. Because his love was so great for you and for I. Come on, somebody. That's exciting, right? Like, it's hard to picture the gruesome part of what he's heading towards. It's hard to picture where he's headed. But when you know that he's willing to suffer, you watch that movie this week, when you think Jesus did that for me, it's a celebration because he suffered and endured so much because of his love, he was motivated by love, guys. And we've said this again and again as we've studied the book of John. For God so loved the world. Not for God so pointed out your sin. Yes, he fixes us. We've talked about that. That's sanctification. He works on us. But his motivation from the very beginning was his deep, profound love for a sinner that didn't deserve it. Come on, that's, that's what this week is about. He's headed somewhere. Something's going to happen. He's willing to suffer because of his deep love for you and for I. He's willing to say, I will go no matter what. Thank you, Jesus, because I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy, and neither are you, and I'm so grateful, so grateful for his love. Jesus came into Jerusalem peacefully and purposefully. He could have fought. He could have resisted. He could have said, don't you know who I am? Yet he submitted. He continued. And he was used for the greatest purpose of all, so that we could have salvation, so that we could have eternal security, so that we could be in heaven with our king. You see, Jesus, Jesus is the prince of peace. And he chose to ride a donkey, right? A bold statement of humility. He chose to write a donkey and fulfill Old Testament prophecy. 
He came in peace, and he came in purpose, and he had you and I in mind as he headed to a place of suffering. You know what I love about the story of the cult? is Jesus' power over that situation. He willingly surrendered everything, but that, the cult had never been ridden before, right? And c you can only imagine the sound of the crowd, people yelling and, Hosanna, and kids, you know, excited, and people maybe even screaming in excitement. Have you ever ridden a horse that wasn't trained? Have you ever seen a horse spook? You send an untrained foal into a massive crowd of people, and it comes in quietly and peacefully and purposefully. See, Jesus is all-powerful. But he is power in humility. He displays it powerfully and perfectly. It doesn't need to be boisterous. It doesn't need to be anything excessive. It was exactly what it was meant to be. It would have been impossible for that cult to go through the crowd calmly and peacefully. But Jesus was powerfully over that cult. You see, he came in as the Prince of Peace. Let's go down and read verses 7 through 11. It says, They brought the donkey and the colt, and they laid their clothes on him, and set him on them. And the great multitude spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes went before him and followed out. They kept yelling, Hosanna, save us, Hosanna, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And when they had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? The multitude said, This is Jesus. This is the prophet from the Nazareth of Galilee. I love, I love this little section right here. What does it say the crowd was? The crowd was moved. The crowd was moved. Something was happening. Guys, I want us to be a church that when we go outside the four walls, that people are moved by the power of Jesus. Now, they might forget it in a little bit, and they might move on, right? But what if they didn't? What if we allowed God to move through us powerfully and purposefully and peacefully? What if where we went, we left an impact on people? that they thought about Jesus, and it left a seed. And maybe it doesn't sprout right away. But later, it produces a, a, a fruit and a field of righteousness. Jesus came, and the crowd was moved. And they laid their garments before him, and they cut down the trees and laid them, each and every piece, before him. You see, Jesus came in as a king. He came in as the Messiah, the son of David. And it was an ancient custom, right? So they would throw the garments down at a royal procession. So they're saying, we recognize you as king. We recognize this scripture from Zechariah in the Old Testament that they will come in riding a donkey, right? They're recognizing what the Old Testament says. They're putting the two together. They're laying the garments down. He is the king. You see, this is the way that princes were often honored. They would cast flowers and garlands and evergreens before a warrior that was returning from victory or a king entering into his kingdom. It was a common way of testifying a joyful and triumphant feeling. And when he came into Jerusalem, just like I said, the city was moved. There was great excitement. There was such a multitude. The shouts of the people, the triumphant procession through the city, excited with much attention. Church, sometimes we're asleep. Not just this morning. I'm just asleep. But I want to be like that triumphant procession. Come on, guys. Wake up, church. Wake up. The king is here. He's, he's present. He's available. He moves in our lives. Are you excited about it? What has he done for you recently? Have you meditated on it? Have you thought on it? Have you given him thanks for the things that he has done? The king is here. Open your heart to him. Allow him to move in your life. In Psalm 118, 25 through 26, this is what it says. Save us, we pray, O Lord. Right, this is one of the uh, scriptures that goes with it. Give us success 
Give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Right? Palm Sunday reminds us that the reign of Christ, the power of Christ, the strength of Christ is greater than any present problem that we have. I'm going to say that again. The Palm Sunday reminds us that Jesus, the king, right, the king that's here, the king that showed up and is knocking at the door, is greater than any current problem that we may have. He is greater. You see, the men and the women in the crowd, they wanted Jesus to fix all their current day problems. But he came to set people free and to bring hope. How many of us come to the Lord with our expectations? God, I want you to do this, and God, I want you to do that. And he'll do it. He'll do it because he's faithful. But maybe he has something better. Maybe he has something better. Maybe we should lay our garments down. Maybe we should submit to what it is that he has for our lives instead of telling him for decades, God, this is what I want my life to be. Instead of, God, what do you want my life to be? We've got to surrender to the king we got to have our hearts open for him to move. We've got to let him come in. Will it take you on a road of suffering? It could. Right? I thought about that a lot this week, and this isn't in my sermon, but it's something I've just been stewing on. When Jesus said, come and follow after me, he said there would be a cost. He said there would be a cost, that it's going to cost you. And our consumerism mentality is, I give one, I get one back. I give one, I get one back. That's not how it works in the kingdom. You are going to be blessed. And sometimes he gives you way back more than that one. Sometimes he gives you an abundant amount. But he said, church, I didn't promise that it would be easy. He said, I promised that I would be with you. And when you say yes, the cost, there's a narrow road and there's a wide road. And I think of that scripture option often, right? Th that narrow road is small and there are few who find it. Why? Because there's a cost involved. And the other road is wide, right? There's a lot of people that find it, but it ends with death. You see, Jesus willingly suffered. And there will be times as a church that he will call us to suffer for others. That he will call us to suffer at some capacity. You say, well, that's, that's not fun. No, but it's real true Christianity. At some point in our walk, he will call us to suffer. Now, here's the difference. I can suffer with him or I can suffer without him, and I'd much rather suffer with him with his peace, with his presence, with his power. You see, he promises to be with us. You see, Jesus willingly went to the cross because he had a purpose. God had a plan to use Jesus to bring all mankind right back to himself. God didn't promise a perfect world, but he promised to be with us. Never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. He promises to walk through us through every hilltop and every valley. He promises to walk with us through all the ways. But church, we've got to get it out of our mind that Christianity is easy and that it's going to cost me nothing. Because if you love Jesus, you're going to let it cost you. You're going to willingly say yes to suffer, and you're going to willingly say yes to things that are hard. If you keep a consumerism mentality, you only come in for what I can get, for what blesses me, how it helps me, right? And, and we start there. We all start there, right? But then Jesus grows us, and he says, you know what? Will you say yes to the cost? You see, the fishermen, the unskilled fishermen, right? these, these very simple men left the only bit of educate, not education, but fishing, their livelihood, their money. They left everything. And Jesus said, come and follow after me, and they went. You see, when Jesus started at the beginning of Holy Week, he said yes to something that was difficult and something that was hard and something that was sacrificial, but it brought life. And there will be moments that you'll have blessings beyond measure. You'll have peace beyond measure. You'll be on the valley top and you'll be praising God for all the good things that he has done. But you can tell when it gets hard by how people react. Because one of two things happen. Their roots go deeper and they say, God, help me through this. Or they run because it's no longer about them. You see, it wasn't about Jesus. He said, I will go to the cross. I will willingly suffer. I will put myself out there because God has a plan. He was still human, even though he never sinned. He sat there. He said, God, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me as he cried tears of blood. And then he surrendered and said, not my will, but yours. God, 
Help us. Help us, church, to grow up in the love of God. Help us to grow up in, in all areas of maturity in the Christian faith. Help us to not have it always be about us, but that we surrender. We lay our garments down and we say, I want to be like Jesus. I want to go into this week with the mentality that I'm going to grow. Yes, I might be uncomfortable. Yes, I might be stretched, but I'm going to lay it down and I'm going to say yes to the cost. Because Jesus is powerful, and he loves us, and he has a plan for you and for I. And as we say yes, our faith grows, our roots go deeper, right? And what happens when the roots go so deep into the ground? It doesn't matter what season comes. It doesn't matter whether it's dry. It doesn't matter whether there's rain. It doesn't matter whether the storms come or whether the storms go because my feet are planted on solid ground and my roots go deep to find the water in every season. And then you grow up into maturity. Church, it's all about Jesus. Yes, he gave everything up for us because he loves you. And yes, yes, in a sense, it's about us. But it's all about him. And Holy Week is all about Jesus. It's all about his willingness to go to the cross for you and for I. And it's all about this big picture mission and this love story from Genesis to Revelation where he says, church, it'll cost you, yes. It costs Jesus. It costs me, my son. But guess what? I'll empower you and I will strengthen you. And part of that love story is that there's people in these seats that are not seated there yet. Will you, church, say yes, even though it's costly? Will you, church, be part of my plan to bring people that are hurting out there into these seats right here? I'm not a crier. I'm more like an even keel personality. But man, if we could just get that, if we could get that, if we could just say yes to the cost, grab somebody's hand next to us and say, I know it's hard. God didn't ask us to do it alone. Let's do it together. And when you fall, I'll pick you up. We'll walk together in the plan that God has. And this week, I want you to think about who's, who's in that seat next to you. Who's not here that's supposed to be in that seat next to you? Who is it that God wants to reach? Is it out of your comfort zone? Probably. Is it going to cost you? Maybe. But God has called the church to rise up, to go into the crowd, and to meet with their rightful king. Because what does Jesus do? He heals broken people. He gives them salvation. He gives them hope. He gives them a future you know, my life may not be perfect, but I follow the one who is. I follow the one who can fix my problems. I follow the one that has the answer. I follow the one that has the provision, the ability to heal. My eyes are fixed on him. This Holy Week, I want you to think about the fact that your eyes need to be fixed upon your king, upon the one that said, yes, I will count the cost. Yes, I will suffer. Yes, I will go because God has called me and I know, I know that you are with me. You are not alone in anything that God has called you to do. And he is calling people to rise up and respond to the call of God. There are times to sit and there are times to stand up and say, God is calling me and I will answer that call. I will say yes, I will answer the call. Not in my own strength, right? Not by might, not by power, right? But by the spirit of the living God. By the spirit of the living God. And guys, we can't do it. Right now, I'm just going to do something I don't normally do. All of our elders or board members, come up here right now at the front. And I want to pray. Because, listen... What happened when the people prayed? Things began to happen. I'm here to tell you that you can't do this on your own. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. You need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you just need a fresh touch from the Lord. If we can play the music and dim the lights. And I'm going to be, all of us down here, praying that God will fill you with all power and all might so you can say yes to the cost and here's the thing, Jesus said yes, but did he run when it got hard? He prayed. 
He went to the cross. He fulfilled his mission. It's not only the strength that you need to answer the call. It's the strength you need to stay in the call when it gets tough. Because God's going to call you and then it's going to get hard and you're going to say, oh, did he really call me? And you're going to question it. So this morning, I want you to be refreshed. I want you to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray in Jesus' name that those that are hungry will come and be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. You need a fresh touch on your life. You need a touch on your finances. You need a touch on your family. That's what the cross is about. It brings healing and wholeness and power to our lives where we have no power. Will you say yes, church? Will you come and be filled? Will you come and be refreshed? Come on. Let's say yes to the Lord today.
God is not in a hurry. He is not in a hurry. He loves you too much to let you walk out of here without breakthrough. If you feel that tug, we're going to be up here just a little bit longer. Don't ignore it. Lay your garments down and just come. Be filled. Be blessed and be empowered by the Holy Spirit. We're not here to judge. We're here to be the church and to go out and fulfill our mission, but we can't do it if we don't have his power. We gotta be filled and we gotta pray and ask God for his power. I take just a few moments longer. If you're feeling that tug, don't leave. Come down and let us pray for you.
the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and a root out of the dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. Come on, somebody. The punishment that brought us peace was upon the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We have peace because the punishment was upon Jesus and not us. We have something. We have something to celebrate today. If you'll bow your heads with me as we close out in prayer, we're going to give the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords praise. And I want you guys to get up out of your seat, stand up, and with your voices, give praise to the King as I pray. Lift your voices loud. Give Him praise. God, we thank you for what you did for us. We thank you for your salvation. We thank you for what you suffered, that you will bore our sins and our shame and our iniquities and by your stripes we are healed church give him praise come on give him praise thank you jesus we did not deserve your forgiveness yet you gave it we did not deserve your mercy yet you gave it hallelujah Thank you, God. I pray for each and every person here this morning that they would know you in a special way, that you would meet with them in a special way, that you would heal their pain, that you would set them on solid ground, and that they would be full of peace and your love and your purpose, your powerful purpose, the mission of the church to bring others to you. Give them the power they need to say yes to the call. Give them the power they need to stay in the call be with them and bless the church in Jesus name we pray before we finish I want to do something else I don't normally do today is full of surprises guys I can't lead you without his power and I need prayer and I'm going to invite you guys our elders to come and pray if you'll just reach your hands out I'm just a person like you and we're going into an important season I feel like just need the power of God, the presence of God, the refreshment of God. I want you to see that nobody's past needing prayer. Nobody is too great or too strong. That we all need a touch from the Lord. Will you come and pray?
guys, we all need the power of Jesus. None of us are past it. Will you lay your garments down this week and say yes to the call? Will you follow him with me as we follow after? God is good and he has great plans. God bless you, church. Stick around for lunch and stuffing eggs and a wonderful festival. Keep your eyes on Jesus this week and all that he did for you and I. Amen. God bless you.